Okay, I think we're up, are we? Check, check, everything looks green at this end. Yes, yes, yes. Good morning, good morning. I almost didn't make it. I slept in this morning. <laughs> I wonder why. <laughs> I'm here, I'm here, I'm here. Good morning, good morning. Another drizzly day. It's funny, in that video, you know, I, I, knew, I should have known this would happen, of course. You know, in that video, I said we've missed our rainy season. There just wasn't much rain this year. I forget what I said. And it was just blistering hot summer weather. Of course, no sooner do I, do I put that on tape when it goes back. The summer is over and it's gone back to rainy season. You know. We do get rain in a normal summer, but this type of rain, this is rainy season type rain, where it's low clouds, misty, muggy, and hot. The summer type of rain is it's hot, bright sunshine during the day and then thunderstorm cloudburst type rain in the afternoon, evening. But this is rainy season rain again. There's this tropical front that's come from the south and it's overlaying the whole country. So that, that classification they really like to do, the meteorological people. Here's the rainy season and now today we switch to summer. It isn't like that. We are now back in muggy, muggy weather. Not good for printmakers, for storing prints, for books. This is the type of weather when everything gets moldy. You know? If you've got you've got a closet, you open your closet and the shoes are moving, you know, whatever. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. <laughs> All right, this is going to be a very low key stream today. We've had lots of activity, we've had different kinds of carving, we've had different kinds of stuff. Today it's low-key and I actually, I considered putting up a message saying, sorry guys, I'm going to sleep in and go for a walk, but I, I'm, whatever, I'm here. There are jobs that need to be done. But it's going to be very low-key, nothing exciting is going to happen. Oh, except at Show and Tell, I received a package for Show and Tell, which I hope is to die for. It's an object that I've been looking for, waiting for, for many, many years. You just have them quietly in the back of your mind. I know that print set existed. I've never seen it. I would like to get it one day. And though two of those print sets came up together on Yahoo Auctions last week. There's a story there too. We'll talk about it at show and tell time. They may not be in such good condition. Whatever. I want to see the prints and see the carving and see how they were made. It's an old Takamizawa set, which I've lusted after for a long time. So we'll look at that as shown tell. But the work itself today is going to be very low key. I'll give you the bad news right now. It's a job that's been on my desk now for uh, over half a year, waiting for me to get time for it. We have a batch of the yokai. I was going to say yokai face-off. They're not yokai face-off. It's called, uh, I can't even remember what we call it. Calamity, yokai calamity. We have a batch of these prints and I have to trim them today. It's just one of those leftover jobs that nobody else wants to do, so it ends up on my desk. So today I'm going to quietly, peacefully trim some of these prints. It'll mean there's lots of time to answer questions and stuff if you have any, whatever. So it's a low, low, low key stream today. Just before we started, somebody out there was saying, should I watch the stream or should I go to bed? And uh, today it's easy. Go to bed <laughs> if, you're in, if you're in Europe, whatever. <laughs> the video, the video. Yeah, it was good fun. It's been a long time coming. The video is what it is. I'm very, very disappointed with things like the color balance and the, the audio, but what are you going to do, you know, an amateur is an amateur, there's nothing to say, you know. <laughs> this morning, I have to share an episode. The YouTube comments are fun. They really, really, really are fun. There's never, almost never a bad comment, a hostile comment. So I can wake up in the morning every time after doing a video, and it's nothing but pleasure to read the YouTube comments. <laughs> but today, I woke up, I woke up a couple of hours ago after I went to the bathroom, got my coffee, whatever. I'm reading the YouTube comments, and two of them just cracked me up so much. I've got to, I copy and pasted one here. I've blurred out the guy's name. I've blurred out the person's name. This comment came in <laughs> last night. 
I've, I've blurred the name a bit in case whatever. So, I mean, somebody actually typed this into a YouTube comment space. I'm not sure. Am I supposed to feel like, mm, yeah, okay, I'm happy with this. <laughs> whatever. And history does not history does not record what his wife said. <laughs> I don't know. So. And then there's another one. I can't show you a screenshot. <laughs> you know this automatic comments. I mean I didn't put I didn't put comments on the thing. I just did my talk. Now it turns out Dave speaks pretty clearly and cleanly. So the YouTube thing in the background that makes you know, text, it listens to what you're doing and it makes text. What's it called? Auto-generated captions. Okay, it's not comments. It's auto-generated captions. It was just turned on. I just leave it turned on. Now, I don't look at it. I don't think about it. But somebody last night must have been watching the thing with the auto-generated captions turned on. He, she, whatever, whatever. I'm sorry, whatever. Yeah, I, they, I don't know. I don't. Anyway, this so this. <laughs> oh, you mean in the comments? Yeah, with the Wi-Fi. I don't know. <laughs> Anyway, go ahead. So to get the story straight, the auto-generated captions. There was something I did. I didn't see it, but somebody had been watching with him, and he saw a caption that must have made him laugh so hard he couldn't believe it. And he sent a comment. You, somebody can look at it and find it. It's in the comments section. And he anyway. The point was, he said, "There's a comment here. You have got to see. You know, the auto-generated thing." And it was, what I had said something was like, it was at the point where I've uh, made the block messy for the first time. I think I said something, and now bring out the pigments. And I had said, and now bring out the pigments. And the auto-generated caption, I must have blurred my speech. So the auto-generated captions took a word, starts with P, five letters, ends with S. <laughs> it said, and now bring out the... <laughs> For, for those of you who are going to chase this, I fixed it. I fixed it. That's one reason why I was late for the stream this morning. <laughs> YouTube does have an edit facility that allows you to go back into the auto-generated captions and, and fix them. So I did. I went back. I thought, should I leave it? It's Just leave it so people can have some fun here. And I thought, well, actually, it, it, I'd better not because, you know, I'd better not. So... <laughs> Uh, no, 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 no. Okay, what we've got here, this is our normal cutting board for chopping these things. You know, this year's series is Match Libo series. So uh, I first, and then recently Wat Nabi San, there's a few of us are teaming up to chop the Match Libo prints. And we have a small problem with that. What we have is each month the labels are a little bit slightly different size. Uh, sometimes they're horizontal, sometimes they're vertical, sometimes they're the same as last month. So each month when we get the batch of prints ready, We've been getting tape and putting it on here so that the, you know the, the cutter person puts the thing against the tape and chops, 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 chops. There's a little thing down at the bottom for, for cutting the top ones. But the thing is, it's different for each month. And what's happening right now is the July prints, we do 300 prints and we print them in batch of 100 plus, 100 plus, 100 plus. The first group is already chopped and gone through. They've been shipped already. The second group, they're chopped and gone through, and they're shipped today. So yeah, they were shipped Thursday and Friday for the people who have paid already. So they're done. But the third group, Sugusan is still printing them. And the Watanabe-san has this tape all carefully placed for cutting the third group of this month's series. And she would be really, really, I mean really unhappy if I move this tape. But my job today is to cut this one. So, sh no, it's not going to fit. If we were magically lucky, it would fit in the same place. It doesn't. So I'm going to have to put some tape on top of this, rather than take this tape off on top of it. So give me a minute here to get this organized. As I said, this is going to be a really, really, really low-key stream. So whatever. Somebody said earlier, should I go to bed or should I watch the stream? The answer is easy if you're in Europe right now. Go to sleep. <laughs> so, <laughs> so. <laughs> so. 
it spelled your name. It didn't even know it. It didn't recognize it as a name. I forget. I just I just retyped over. So I don't remember what was there first, Kantar. I don't remember how it spelled your name, but uh, I'm sorry. It's gone. I, I corrected it with a real thing. In fact, I made a mistake. I first I spelled your name Q-A-N-T-A-A-R. Then when I saw your comment here this morning, realized that I too had made a mistake and went back. But it's your fault. If you've got such a difficult name to spell, you've got to expect it to be misspelled. <laughs> The rest of the CCs, I haven't checked the rest of the CCs. I did one. I did a global uh, replace because it didn't understand the word gumby. It thought it was gumby, G-U-M-B-Y, I guess an English word. So I did a global replace on, uh, on uh, gumby. But if you want more fun, go and look at the captions. And I think actually Dave's speech, my, my normal talk, is is straightforward. I use simple words for the most part. I speak basically slowly, clearly, so the auto-generated stuff works pretty well for me. Okay, excuse me a minute. Let me get this sorted out here. Oops, drop the tape. This batch of prints was made by Ishikawa-san, and it would have been made, oh, I don't know, really, literally about six months ago, and it's been sitting on my desk since then. I know the reason the job could wait is because we're not actually out of stock of these things, but I heard from Omi the other day, well, it was part of our year-end inventory, I heard from Omi that uh, we are now, there's only three sets left or something, three or four, so they want these now, I have to get these done. Nope, still no good. We can't use this in the other direction. There's the registration marks were here, and the sheets of paper all differ in the height, so I can't use it from this direction. Always when we're trimming these prints, we have to start at the registration mark. Obviously, we can't do anything else. We start at the registration mark. And this also is a little bit different. This is confusing to people who saw the video last night. Last night's video had match labels printed five, and then we rotated the paper and printed five. This set is not. This is a single set of 10 match label prints with one registration mark. So they were printed as one batch, bang, bang, bang. So this is doubly confusing to people who saw last night's video. It's not the same thing, don't get confused. Our aim is to confuse here, it seems, sometimes. Well, the chopper's right-handed, but that's life when you're a lefty. Can't be helped. It's okay, actually, too. It means I can hold it with my left hand, which is careful, and chop with my right hand. And the chopping is, you uh, know, it's rough work, so. So I did the correction, I don't know, whatever, what can I say, about 30 minutes or so ago. So maybe it, it takes time to propagate. I don't know. I'm sorry. I did the correction, and I myself reloaded the video, and the correction did take... But whether it has to propagate on YouTube around the world or something, I don't know. 
Anyway, bonus feature. If you still got the bad word there, it's a bonus feature. <laughs> Whatever. <laughs> Take a screenshot. <laughs> Take a screenshot and preserve it for us, because I didn't do that, so. <laughs> Why am I getting different results every time I put this piece of paper down there? First it said pull this off, and it said use it. What's going on here? Hang on a sec. Now it looks like that green is okay. What's going on here? I think it might be okay, you know? Excuse me a second. We were talking about that ninja ref we were talking about that ninja reflection to show. I don't know if this gives me any legal right to show those kids. I don't think so. Judge, Your Honor, I wasn't shooting kids, I was just shooting my own workshop. They happened to walk by in the reflection. I didn't know they were there. Yeah, tell it to the judge. You know. <laughs> All right. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Life is fun. Life is fun. The comments too. There was more comments. You know, there was another one. There was another one I didn't copy for. The guy said something about uh, about hair, and he said, "I forget the exact comment. It's there. People can find it." He said, "Please give me your recipe." Or what did he say? To give me your, your uh, hair care routine. To teach us about your hair care routine, because your hair is glorious or <laughs> something. <laughs> this question comes up. It does come up. And my hair care uh, my hair care routine is really simple. But choose your genes carefully. There's nothing else to say. Choose your genes. No, first, someone's asking about frist or first. I don't seem to get that. People don't seem to do that on our channel. I don't know why. I think what happens is they're just uh, they're too busy getting ready to watch the uh, to watch the thing. I am struggling with this position here today. This placement. I am struggling with this. Put it in, it doesn't seem right. Take it out, it doesn't seem right. I'm not sure what's going on here. Got it here. Someone's asking about what, this this print. Is there a color tint in the gray background here? Are you talking about this print? I can say almost certainly yes, because we have a house rule. We almost never print bare gray without I'm not, tinting it. It's sort of a general rule. We've talked about this before both ways. The, the Mokohankan concept here, the Mokohankan concept, Dave's concept of mixing colors and stuff. <clears throat> we have our traditional palette of six, seven, eight colors which we mix and a house rule, and they all know this, is we would never use one of the colors raw even if we didn't really want to, if we didn't want to make a purple, if we just had the red rather than the blue or whatever, we would still never use the red raw. We always try and, what's the word, rich in it a bit. We would add a tiny, tiny, tiny touch of black to any one of our colors. This makes our palette look uh, really, really unified. And it works both ways. If we are printing in tones of gray, we never use just black all by itself. 
So there's three tones here, excuse me, the black itself is just black. It's just a rich, full black. The two grays here absolutely have something mixed into them. And it's sometimes really difficult even to tell what they are, but if they weren't there, the gray would look boring. I, I don't know if you can see this. I mean, see this, with these, we've got these uh, color balance issues here all the time. But this gray, if I was gonna guess right now, I would say that has a tiny touch of purple inside. It's not blue, it's not red. I think she's put, or maybe she's put both. She's put the tiniest bit of, of red and blue in there, and we have an extremely faint purple cast. This is almost like a lilac. If you close your eyes and blur it a bit, you can see it. There's a lilac touch to it. It's really subtle. Normally people wouldn't notice. If we didn't do it, nobody would com complain, but it does give things that, that ukiyo-e tone, that ukiyo-e color feel. We don't use bright, clean colors, and we never use them raw, never. So you're saying bluish, we have, we have you know, white balance issues here, so I'm sorry, what I'm seeing in real life and what you are seeing through that camera's balance issues and this software and your monitor are going to be different, I'm sorry. I'm seeing a very faint lilac here, so I don't know, she's not here to ask, so whatever. It is lilac. Now, well, again, too, there's another issue here, too, the lights that are shining on my desk here. As I put that print down over there, lilac, lilac. But I'm staring at a bunch of a bank light here. spilled my coffee, you know, <laughs> upstairs. First off, you wake up in the morning and first off is paper out. I went up there and uh, Dei Chan's coming today. So I went upstairs and first job is to pay paper out. And while I'm up there, I quickly kettle, make a quick cup of instant coffee while I'm upstairs. Stagger back down, back into my phthong because there's no swimming on the weekend. I don't go swimming on Saturday. My pool card doesn't work on weekends. so. So I could relax. So I went upstairs at six, took the paper out of the fridge, got a coffee, and sat back to relax for a while. The next job I had to do was, uh, because it's Saturday, I had to open the flea market Friday. So I did that at seven o'clock. You know. And then I start browsing the YouTube comments. <laughs> and I spilled my coffee. <laughs> So today it's laundry day up there for my, for my phone cover, whether I like it or not. <laughs> It wasn't a full cup, it was just a couple of mouthfuls left, but uh, whatever, 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 whatever. The comments here inspire me in your way of working. Thank you, sir. All I can do is I'm not, you know, trying to do anything special, I'm just trying to enjoy life. Trying to enjoy life. Enjoy my work, trying to help people out here, trying to have fun. It's really actually kind of a selfish approach to life, I think. I don't <laughs> The selfish idea is that I'm just doing this for myself. I don't care about anybody else. <laughs> but the things that I do, seem, people seem to like it and get benefit from them, so maybe it's not so selfish. I don't know. But I think at heart, I am actually really you know, quite selfish, I guess. I don't know. Don't know. <clears throat> We've talked about this too in a bit of a tiny bit more serious vein, you know. I don't know, there's this concept in business around most of the world, and it's here in Japan too, in these terms, it's called Chakudaichi. Customer comes first, all this kind of stuff. It's a common meme, it's a common idea, it's a common thing. The customer comes first. And we've talked about this before, and it's at, yeah, at first what I say sounds maybe awful, but for us we don't do it that way. We don't play it that way. It's not the customer comes first. In here in Japan, if you do that, that allows you to be browbeaten. Customers can take over and control you, and the staff can be, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. We don't play it that way. 
customers are just other people. They have good ideas, bad ideas. They're right or they're wrong. They're just people. So for us, it's not customer comes first. It's the people who work here. They come first. There's our, they're, they are our priority here. Having said that, of course, what makes our work pleasant and fun and enjoyable is bringing good value to society, having customers come in and enjoy the thing. And that stuff. So in that sense, it's rather than who's first, who's on top. It's just we're doing this all together. We want to enjoy our meaningful lives, making products that are useful to society, doing it in a way that gives us super pleasure to do. We talked about that before, kicking ass, you know, and bringing pleasure to the people out there. So, so it's not customer comes first. It's we're all in this together. Let's try and have fun. She did a nice job on this, you know. She did a good job. I know. She not just each cousin who did this particular group, but the other printers too. I know. For little prints like this, sometimes we do it a few different ways. You've heard me talk about the black in our ukiyo-e prints. I don't have one in front of me. Whatever the prints you're going to see in the flea market, they're going to have outline work and colors, and there might be some black zones. So black is two things on a typical ukiyo-e print. It's not really black at first, it's outline type work. And then black also sometimes comes in as a color. You know, black hair on a beauty's hair or something like this. <clears throat> this one is a bit different. The black here, because there's no actual outlines of these people, this out black for the, the, the frame, we really want a good rich black. If it was too weak and too gray here, it would just look weak. And then we use, you know, tinted gray inside. So for her, this was difficult. To, for our normal type of printing, she would have thinned down her sumi ink, and this outline block would have been more, quote, gray. But because for this particular kind of prints, we want it black, she has a problem. It's got to be a thick pigment. It's got to have good pressure. But having said that, there are fine lines on the border here. So this is the tough. For these prints, this, this looks really, really simple. They are tough. Getting these inner borders printed nice and black, but without spoiling, putting too much pressure in and smashing them, smucking them. And what she's done here, yeah, I can see it. Before printing, she has put her paper through a press. It's called urabaran, using a baron on the back side before you print. You use your baron to flatten the paper before you print so that you can print your key blocks with a lighter touch, kissing the paper and it comes out smooth. She didn't do it with her baran, Ura baran. She actually put them through our etching press upstairs. There's prints we can do that with, and there's prints we can't do it with, because if we want a lot of nice rich embossing or something in the print, we can't kill the paper texture first. But for something like this, kill it, flatten it, and then get your beautifully smooth gray and your beautifully thin outlines. Case by case, case by case. No, we're going to cut these. These all go on cut. And this is not a series. Again, now this might be confusing because this year's subscription series is a match label set. It looks like this is part of it. This is not part of this year's subscription series. It's no connection at all. This is a general item in the Moko Hong Kong catalog. It's called a calamity of yokai. And it's a set of 10 match label prints, and it's not part of our subscription series. My apologies for the confusion here. We sell it as a set of 10 in a little envelope, along with a wrapper. Someone's got the page. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Okay, I had a list of things that I was going to talk about and ask about today. And one of them is much more serious than the things we've chatted about so far. I need some advice 
on how to, I was going to say, I need some advice on how to break the law. And that's not right. What I mean is I need some advice on how to do something and avoid breaking the law while I am doing it. And when I first tell you about this, many of you will have answers right away. Bang, 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 bang. There's, we have explored this extensively, and almost all the quick answers you're going to have will have barriers in the way. But anyway, I want ideas and I want answers. And it's to deal with PayPal. It's a PayPal issue. Some of you may have knowledge of this and some won't. Let me outline our problem for you. And it really is a problem. And there may be no answer. We may just have to suck it up and go with this. Or maybe some financial genius out there or whatever, anybody, will have some idea. Here is our problem. PayPal is really, really good for us, useful for us. Without PayPal, we would not be able to run our business in the way that we do, by sending small amounts, small packages, out around the world to many, many different countries. And we're talking about the way that we get paid for this. The PayPal system, because it's global, and because it works in currencies all over the world, and because it's a known item, even though lots of people love to hate PayPal, they actually do their job very, very efficiently. They allow us to present small-scale items and be paid by people around the world. So be it. There are other systems in place. There's Stripe, there's Square, there's Amazon Checkout. There's a million different ways to do this. We've investigated many, many of them, and they, all the ones except PayPal have barriers. And much of those barriers are legal barriers. For example, Square has Square.Japan. They are incorporated in Japan, and we, as living in Japan, our Square businesses must be handled only in yen. Square is not legally allowed to handle dollar transactions to us. So we cannot send you a Square invoice and you pay in dollars and we get either dollars or yen. It's not legally possible. PayPal is not a bank here in Japan. They are a money transfer service. I don't know what they are overseas, but here in Japan, they are a money transfer service based in Singapore with customers in Japan. And they are not a bank, so they are allowed to take dollars from people, hold them from me as dollars inside the PayPal system. And then when I need it, they are allowed to transfer to me in only one way, to my bank account in Japan, which must be a yen bank account. This is a legal requirement. We have a dollar bank account here. PayPal cannot connect to it. And this is not just those guys being obstreperous. This is a thing. So PayPal takes from our customers in dollars, which we want, and they send to me in yen, which sounds cool, but their exchange rate is 6% off the normal bank exchange rate. The one I looked at yesterday, our normal bank was giving 138.2 or something like this for selling yen. PayPal offered me 131.7 or something. This is the way they roll. They make a huge, huge, huge amount of money on their spread. They're not a bank. They're a money exchange service. And all we have to do is bend over and they take care of the rest. They, there's other fees involved. If people pay by credit cards, PayPal, of course, we lose the, whatever it is, 2.75% to the credit card part of it, stuff like that. That's unavoidable. We understand that. We know about credit card fees. It's that once the credit card fees are all over, PayPal, what they call is an exchange fee, they simply make their exchange rate, as I said, 6% off a normal international rate, and that's what we have to pay. So what that means is, because 99% of our income comes through PayPal overseas, our yearly income, PayPal takes about 5% of it as their grotesque fee. Well, so far, as I said, without their services, we wouldn't be able to operate. So we've been paying for their convenience and everything. So, 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 someone's saying here, you've been using PayPal for 20 years for international business. I get it. I get it. I get it. I'm not sitting here saying, PayPal is evil. Let's all take them down. That's not my point. We have, for all these years, we've been paying this. But having said that, paying for their services, which work really well for us, it still hurts to take 6% off an exchange transaction. So I'm thinking, what else can I do here? I, in no way 
I'm going to try and subvert PayPal system, but is there some other way that I can move money from my PayPal account in dollars? Is there some different way that I can move that money to me here without losing an arm and a leg along the way? And without breaking any laws. We send the money. We remember we're not allowed to have multiple PayPal accounts. So, so you can't get money from one place to another without losing on fees. I understand it. We get fees. But 6%? We're talking about we're, this year we are going to do just around Ichioku N. Ichioku N. We are going to do this year, if, if, unless there's a global economy crash. Our, our income this year will be, we're not going to do a million dollars, but we're close to it. If the exchange rate was the same as it was last year, our income this year, the 23, 24 of us working here, our income would be just about a million dollars. And to lose 5% of that to what seems like a kind of unfair fee hurts. And most of the problem here is Japanese banking regulations. That are in the so what we need to do is this. We need to take our PayPal US dollars, draw them down to a US dollar account in the US, at which point there will be no transaction fees and no exchange fees. Then from that bank in the US, we do a normal international bank transfer to our bank here. That would have a fee, $550, something like that. And once we have the money here in our U.S. bank account here, we change it to yen at the normal exchange rate. So if we had a U.S. account, then we could do this with no problem whatsoever. But of course, as you know, you can't just open bank accounts in the world, all over the world anymore. So if Dave here had had the foresight many years ago to open a U.S. bank in a U.S. bank account somewhere, I could now use that to do this, but I don't have one. Anyway, I'm not seeing all the comments, so I'm going to look very carefully through the comments here in case there's somebody has an idea that we haven't thought of. <clears throat> And part of the problem here, of course, is the, uh, the Japanese government has very, 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 very tight regulations to stop money laundering. And any time we try and think about how to go around this, we run into the money laundering. Some suggesting Stripe can't use it. Doesn't matter. Can't use it. I can't. With Stripe, I can't take payments in any currency other than yen. And we need to be able to offer our products to Americans in dollars, to Europeans in euros, to Brits in pounds. And that's the biggest problem with the other uh, providers. Something we need an account, and we talk to our tax accountant about this, you know. He just throws up his hands. He knows nothing about international. We, we were teaching him how this works, you know. Anyway, the idea is out there. If, if someone is out there who has knowledge of this, whatever, I will look forward to reading their ideas. Thank you for anything. I'm not going to spend the whole rest of the hour talking about this. So anyway, thank you. Well, someone's saying, raise our prices to account for it. I mean, that sort of has already been done. I know the PayPal fee we've been paying for these years, it is, it's baked into our income and expense statement, of course. So uh, we're doing fine. We don't need money. We're fine. This is in no way a request for money or anything. So yes, it is baked into our prices. So actually, if I could figure out a way to get around this, we would either be more profitable or we could lower our prices. So it is baked in. Of course, all of our expenses are over the years now. We're not new in business, so all of our expenses have become baked into our prices, of course. I will read the chat. Yes, I get the trash. I get the chat transcript about 11 o'clock every morning Tokyo time, and I look through it most of the time. Today, I will definitely look through it. So thank you. If you've made a suggestion here, I will see it. 
Thank you. Don't worry about repeating it now. If you've made a suggestion, I will definitely read it. Thank you very much. We're also talking about teaching, I know, going back some years now. I know, going back, this will be 15 years or more, I, I had a mini audit from the tax people. Not, not anything serious. They, this was before we had Mokohanka on the company, when I was working as an individual. I had a mini audit, meaning they really wanted to clarify where does your income come from. And what they asked for, they, they visited my home in Ome. They asked to see my physical bank books, because that's the sort of record here in Japan. All transfers, people don't pay by cash in Japan, they pay by bank transfer and stuff like this. So they asked me, let me see your bank books. I got them out, they looked through it, looked through it, looked through it. And it was clear right away that there wasn't anywhere near enough money, any enough record of transactions to show the income I had declared. It wasn't I hadn't declared enough. My income was declared more than was showing in the bank. So they said, well, well there's more income. Well, where, what's happening? He said, oh, I'm online. I'm online. Look at this. Look at this. And I showed them my website. This is 19, like, this is 2000 or something like this. I showed them the website. I said, well, how, how does that money get to it? I said, it's, it's through by PayPal. And the guy says, these are two people from the tax office, the local tax office. Says, pay, pay, what's this? I said, it's PayPal. It's a way that money moves around. And they asked me to explain. I had to log into my PayPal account while they both watch and all this kind of stuff. So I was teaching people from my local tax office how money moves from overseas and stuff. And they asked me, that, yeah, can we download the spreadsheet from PayPal for last year? Does it match your income? Because they're mostly worried that someone like me with a little private business had income and I was only declaring like half of it or something like this. That was their only concern. Is this guy really declaring his income? They weren't caring about the expense declarations or anything. And yeah, I was clean. I always am clean. I declare everything. It's okay. I'm a, I'm a very square, straight, boring guy, and my finances were perfect. But I did have to teach them how it worked. So. Anyway, enough of that, enough of that. Just the, the ideas out there, if somebody has knowledge of how I might be able to move in a different way. Other than that, let's put this to bed. Thank you. There is something else I'm kind of surprised. Now that there's, I got my little memo there. There was three things I was supposed to talk about. And one other one, and I'm surprised. I was expecting someone like maybe Tom's 1060 or a couple of other people to bring this up. There's something else that happened last week, last Tuesday. <laughs> it was my three month you know, glaucoma check last week. On Tuesday, I went to the hospital on Tuesday for the three-month checkup, and I had missed the previous three-month checkup because I was in Canada uh, on that emergency, helping uh, helping take care of my mother for a while. So I missed my three-month checkup. So this was a six-month checkup. So long story short, yes, I put my head in the big machine there last week, Tuesday. And you know how it works, those of you who have eye checks and stuff, there's a big machine and they show stars and stuff inside it and you keep fixed at one point and they show stars and when you see a star you click, yep, there's a star, beep, they're checking peripheral vision and you know, whatever. And you have to keep, you have to keep fixated while they show stars at different places. And if they show a star here and if you can't see it in your peripheral vision, you don't click and they realize, aha, that's a blind spot for him. And if they show a star and you see it and you click, so they get a map. They build up a map of, of your retina here, places that you can see and places you, you can't see. And long story short, the, the area in my right eye that is dead is expanded something slightly over what it was six months ago. That's the sort of not so good news. My glaucoma is progressing bit by bit by bit. The other part of it, 
Is it good news or bad news? I don't know. <laughs> they talk about what they call intraocular pressure. You know, if the pressure inside your eyeball is too high, you take medications and stuff to reduce it, and that supposedly reduces the progression of the glaucoma. So the good, good news for me or bad news? The good news for me is there is no high pressure. I'm, I was 13 and 15. What is it? I don't know what the numbers mean. She just says 13, 15. It's, it's milligrams of pressure. I, I don't know That's what the numbers mean. Anyway, point being, both of my eyes have low pressure, so no medication necessary. That's good news, but it's bad news in that they can't do anything, <laughs> so I don't know. Anyway, slight progression, nothing dramatic, and the other good news is there isn't any sign of this happening at all in the left eye. The visual field test showed no blank spots, and when the doc looks inside, too, the, the the check of your retina. So it seems I'm okay. My right eye, I'm 70 now. It will be gone before I'm 100. You know, we don't know where this is all going to go. It'll probably be gone before I'm 90. But the left eye shows no damage whatsoever. Yeah, I'm eyeballing this. I'm eyeballing. Someone's asking, am I against this green thing? No. It turned out that we need to be just a little here, a little hair breadth off. Bingo. So no, I am eyeballing it. Somebody's eagle-eyed out there. As I said, I think it's critical here not to disturb her tape. So it would be simple for me to rip her tape off and put a new piece, but no, that would cause much more trouble than it's worth. So I am eyeballing this. So someone's saying, as long as your prints remain 2D, I just need one eye. But unfortunately, I carve, and carving happens in the real world. And I have tried this, actually. I have tried this, closing my eye, you know, patching, whatever. I've tried with a microscope with one of the lenses out. And the quick, easy answer is I can't do it. The untested answer is, if I have to, will I be able to train my brain to do this? I don't know. If you're a baseball player, here comes the ball. If you only have one eye, if you just stood at the plate right now and tried to do it, you can't because you can't focus on it. But if you've been playing baseball for 99 years and you see the size of the thing and here it comes, I think you could sort of get away with this with one eye because it shows you how big it is and where it is. You don't have the stereoscopic thing to do the, the field of where it is. You can't measure where it is, but your experience tells you where it is. So I'm thinking that as this thing decays, and bit by bit by bit I can't use my right eye, I'm thinking that I will still be able to carve because of what it looks like, even though there's no real stereoscopic view. Whatever, I don't know, I don't know. We will find out, we will find out, I will find out. If I can do it, I'll keep doing it. If it turns out that it's game over and at some point this thing progresses so far and I just can't carve anymore, and that's it. We'll, we'll have a little sale, carving tools for sale or whatever, and I'll do something else. You know, it's not like there isn't anything else in life I could do, you know. Maybe make more YouTube videos, I don't know. So we're okay, I'm not, you know, David's not gonna go upstairs and jump off the roof when you can't carve anymore. Relax, I'm okay. It'll just be plan B or whatever plan it is by now.
So I was asking if they have a good place to contact Dave. All of our websites have contact forms. They don't come to me directly. They contact forms on our websites, go to the staff. But of course, they let me know. So if you need to talk to me or a message for me, just hit one of our contact forms. It's okay. Actually, one way too to get directly to me you know, on my old woodblock.com website. The contact form there does come directly to me, not to the Mokohamkan staff. So, uh, so yeah, join my inbox. one more here, last one, then we'll have to switch to chopping sideways. Tom Tinsitzi asking, who is your red marker sponsor from the video DH? Actually, I think you already know the answer to that. And that's all I can say here at this point. the long way now we have to switch to the short way and it's another setup here so let's have a look at what's going on this is also going to take me a minute to sort out I warned you it was going to be a low-key stream here today nothing really going on today I also have to sort out pretty soon now my next carving job now that I've finished the August print set I did before that the share certificate, before that the Patreon chibi print, so now we have to go figure out a new job. And there's a couple of things on tap for me. Of course there's the Okada Yoshio project, that's going to be actually my next main carving job. Today's Saturday, I don't think I can have that ready Monday, there's tracing still to do. I did a bit of tracing already but it's a mess, I gotta start again. So it won't be ready Monday, but maybe by Thursday or next week, my carving job on the Okada Yoshio print might be up and running, ready to go. So that will be the bulk of my work on the streams uh, over the rest of the summer, perhaps, the Okada Yoshio print. But that won't be ready for a while, so I'm not quite sure. As far as other job goes, my God, my job list, we, we don't want to talk about it. What do you want to talk about? In case he's listening today, Taran san, you're on deck this weekend. Taran san and William and Steve, the three of you, hopefully this weekend, just stand by, please, stand by. That's a message for Taran san if he's here today. He's really been patient with me. He's been super patient, he never complains, although I've promised and not delivered, promised and not delivered Taran-san this weekend. Then I've, what else have I got to do? It's financial year and I've got to talk to Miyagawa-san, the brush lady here, the, the lady who makes brushes. You know, those of you who visited here, Miyagawa Brush Workshop is about five minutes walk down the street here. The lady who runs it, Kumiko-san, She's the daughter of the couple who ran it for all the years I knew them. She came to talk to me the other day and uh, she's got some news and uh, we have to jump in it seems. We really need those brushes and her news was not, uh, not what I want to hear. Upstairs we've been fooling with block making. We make our own blocks because nobody else has any that we can use. We've talked about Chitty Tori for paper making. Well, the paper making is going to have to wait because brush making looks like it's going to have to become a priority. So, so that project is waiting for me. 
there's the two NDA projects. I can't talk about them. One for the company in Europe and one for the company in uh, England. Eight cats. I got to get eight cats running. There's. We've got to get the fifth one starting. The fourth one needs test printing again, and we need to get the fifth one up and running. And I need more designs. I've got to refresh the eight cats website, make a video, ask for some more prints. Eight cats is waiting for me. Ukiwe Heroes, the 10th anniversary. August 1st is the 10th anniversary of the Ukiwe Heroes Kickstarter campaign. I would like to do something to splash. There's more, there's more, but whatever. There's more, there's more. Taran-san. Okay, Taran-san is here. <laughs> Nothing else to say. He's just now, he's, he's heard this before. He's heard me talk about this before. He just now wants me to shut up and, and get busy. <laughs> so, but with the video out of the way, Talansan, now it's time to uh, time to get to work. So. <laughs> He's been so patient, so patient. Do this, you're just gonna drop on the floor. What has she done with this? Let me get this out of the way. You're gonna start a new carving today, okay? <laughs> Whatever. He gave up on me and he started something else. Whatever. Anyway, I'm gonna get this ready this weekend, Taransan. So, whatever. The blocks are ready. And in that video, Taransan, the video, if you've watched the new YouTube video, the blocks that Aoyama saw are cutting, that's the Mitsugiri Ban. Mitsugiri Ban. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Yes, this is it. Is it show and tell time? Because I'm really looking forward to that show and tell today. Takamizawa prints. I don't think they're pre-war, although it's possible. They could be pre-war. I'm kind of hoping they are. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. way for me to use my time is it but whatever can't be helped this job has got to be done Yoshida print okay I know I know Taransa you were showing me before a bunch of Yoshida print designs I've got to keep a bunch of things in mind, Taransan. It's not just the ability to carve these things, it's you know, printing. Printing, printing, printing. The printing crew we have here is pretty competent, but a lot of the Yoshida designs, including a couple of the ones that you showed me before, are, are pretty complex. They're really, really pretty complex. So I have to keep in mind something that you and I can carve together something that's legally free of copyright, the Yoshida prints all are, but it's also got to be something I can practically get into production and keep into production, and it's got to be something that people in the shop will say, oh, look at that, that's so nice. I've got to hit all those buttons, Tarans. 
and some of the ones you showed me earlier failed one or two of those tests. We've got to be able to print it. We've got to be able to print it. Anyway, this weekend I will work with you on this, back and forth, back and forth. And we sort of talked about it a little bit before, but uh, I have to hit a bunch of buttons, not just not just, you know, oh, nice print. There's lots of nice prints out there. We have to have one that can go into practical production. Practical production. On your own, yeah, well, go, 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 anything. Of course, that's nothing to do with me. Speaking of Yoshida prints, and there's something else. This is sort of not public news, but I can talk about it because it's uh, Numabisan. The person who, the, the professional printer, Numabe Shinkichi, he does most of the printing for the Yoshida family these days. Any Toshi Yoshida prints that you see in the marketplace these days are all printed by numabe -san. He's a printer about my age. No, not about my age. He is my age. And he's been the Yoshida uh, house printer now for oh, over a decade. He took over from Komatsu-san when Komatsu-san retired. A decade more, 15 years or so. So numabe -san has worked and is still working as the Yoshida house printer. He has also set up on his own right what he calls Numabe Mokuhang. Numabe Mokuhanga, Japan woodblock prints by Numabe. And he's been making reproductions of Koson slash Shoson prints. There's a new bunch in the market. There's three of them in the marketplace these days. If you Google and find them, Numabe san has arranged with a, a carver here in town to get them carved, and Numabe san is printing them. So they've got their own little company now up and running because they're not, they don't want to depend on the Yoshida work all the time. Long story short, he sent me an email while I was in Canada saying, Dave, we have a new idea. For the Numabe Mokohan place, we are going to start doing reproductions of Hiroshi Yoshida prints now that the copyright is all okay. Would you want these in your shop? And I replied quite simply, yes, I'd be quite happy to have them in my shop if they're your normal level. If you can make them up to the level that you've been doing so, Yes, we would happily have Hiroshi Yoshida reproductions here. He died in 1950. The copyrights are long clear. They cleared a few years ago, and we're in the, in the clear. Let me know when you've got something ready, and we'll be love to have it in our shop. So I, that was when I was in Canada. Time went by. His wife was in here a few weeks ago, a couple of weeks ago, delivering some Yoshida prints. And I asked her, what's the news, this plan of making Hiroshi Yoshida prints? Hey, let's, what, any, any movement, any action? When are they going to be ready? And she did the usual, the Japanese thing, you know, thumb up in front of your nose, wave your hand sideways. Not going to happen. So I asked her, what do you mean not going to happen? What's going on? And she said, copyright. And I'm like, Numabe-san, Hiroshi Yoshida died in, 20, uh, in 1950. Japanese copyright law and European copyright law is death plus 70. He's been dead for 72 years. His work is all in the public domain. She says, no, the family doesn't want us to do it. And I'm like, what do you mean the family doesn't want you to do it? Beethoven's great, 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 great grandson doesn't want us to play the Ninth Symphony? It's not his business. Those things are in the public domain. And she said, no, they don't want us to do it. We don't want to get them upset. So there aren't going to be, from the Mabe, a new series of reproductions of Hiroshi Yoshida prints. Someone says, the Japanese way don't make waves. Dave here already has one Hiroshi Yoshida print in his catalog. I published it January the 2nd, the year the copyright became free. <laughs> Am I a bad guy? I don't think so.
So it's too bad. So anyway, Taran San and I are considering, among other things, Taran San and I are going to, you know, I'm going to send some, some wood to Taran San for carving. And we would like to do, if we can find one that's doable, we will do a Hiroshi Yoshida design to add to our catalogue. They're pretty complex, so it may be that rather than Hiroshi Yoshida, I'll work with Taran San, we'll do something maybe Hasui or Koitsu, because a lot of those are much more manageable. Hiroshi Yoshida designs, they are really over the top on printing, most of them. So, whatever, whatever, whatever. Yeah, Rangaksha is on this too. There's also, there's a different approach to this, even though that an old book might be in a museum, so the museum, even though the book was published a million years ago, the museum will hold copyright on the photography. So if you want to get a picture of this book, sorry, it's under copyright, you can't publish it. And that's a gray zone. It's also, I understand, to what they've done. Our policy here at Mokohankam, we do have a collection of old prints. We have photographed them very carefully and put them online. And we have made it very clear that go ahead, use them. We are not going to hold copyright on the photographs. And our collection page has this. We do have rights in the photographs, but it clearly says, go ahead and use these things. But your, your average museum, your metropolitan museum or your foundation, whatever, like Rangaksha is talking about, they have to make a living. They have to make a living. So it's, it's an open issue and one that uh, there's no easy, quick solution for it. But the artwork itself, Hiroshi Yoshida's work, is in most countries of the world, certainly in Japan and in Europe, it is in the public domain. Someone's asking, how old is Taran San? You'll have to ask him. I'm, I'm not quite sure. Does it begin with a two or a three? I don't know. It begins with one of those two numbers. Oh, Taran San says he's 29. Yeah, that's about the guess, Michelle. Do we have any Hasui prints in the collection? Yes, yes. I'm not a big, I know. <coughs> It's not the focus of our collection. I've never had the budget to be able to buy a lot of things like Hasui originals. I have a few. I have a couple of pre-war Hasuis in the collection, but it's not my thing. Our associate Toshikazu Doi, he has dozens and dozens and dozens of very carefully. He has a mini Muller collection, Doi-san. But no, I myself don't. It's been out of my budget. You know. I'm a very small scale collector. Very small scale. Sean tell stuff today, you know, <laughs> I have to confess something about this, you know. I screwed up the bidding on the auction the other day. I broke a basic rule. I didn't read the information on the, on the auction page carefully, and I screwed up big time when I entered my bid. Actually, in my own defense, I had fallen asleep that evening and woke up. Oh, I'm supposed to bid tonight. I scrambled to the computer, and there was like six minutes left on the first auction. Oh, I'm in time. Banged in my bid to get it in before the little five-minute warning time, you know. And that was a big, big, big mistake that cost me probably a couple of hundred dollars. <laughs> Most of the auctions on Yahoo, they are, they're not snipable. 
they have this deal. Yahoo Auction, the default setting is any new high bid extends the time for five minutes. So if you are an eBay aficionado and you've come here and you think, I'm going to snipe this by putting my bid in 10 seconds before the end, go ahead and the auction will automatically add five minutes and they will send an email to everybody saying, hey, there's another bid, go back at it, guys. You know, it's really good for the sellers. It's really good for the sellers, for the buyers, it's sometimes a bit frustrating. Whatever, it is what it is. Anyway, my point of my story is I quickly, without reading it, I jammed my, my top bid in just before the five-minute mark so it wouldn't extend it. And it turned out, then I looked at the details. Oh, it's turned off. This one was snipable. There's no automatic extension on this one. So I should have held my bid and just put it in at the, you know, 10 seconds before the end, five seconds before the end. That way, nobody has time to do this. And yep, buddy, exactly what I feared happened. Somebody got in there, and over the five minutes, he climbed up and pushed me, 1,000 yen, 1,000 yen, 1,000 yen. He pushed me from nothing over the top of my maximum bid. And if I had done the right thing, if I had held my bid back until 10 seconds before the end, so it's my own fault, my own stupidity. I put my bid in too soon, and it cost me, cost me, cost me. I really wanted the set. He pipped me, but now, by now I've learned this is snipable. So I prepared a new max bid, something I also never, never do. I never get outbid and rebid. I always prepare what's my max willing to pay for this, put it in, and close the browser window. And I never go back and rebid again. But today I really wanted that set, and I was so frustrated with myself. Can't be helped. Someone's asking me, did I buy two sets of eight views? You were watching. Were you the guy bidding against me? Is that you bidding a thousand, 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 thousand all the way up? Neidhart von Ruental. <laughs> was this you? <laughs> Whatever. If it was, that's what it is. So, you know, so. <laughs> well, somebody says nobody likes snipers anyway. You know, it's the real way. It's the way that should work. All in a circle, right? Got your top bid. Put your top bids on the table. Bang, let's go. And the top bid wins. Sniping is not evil. It's just that's the most sensible way to do it. And it avoids this, oh, maybe I should bid more. Oh, let's bid more. It avoids the emotional thing. It takes, it takes all the emotion out. It takes the excitement out. It makes it into a clean business deal. Everybody put your top bid, put them on the table. Bang. So I have no problem with sniping. I don't think it's evil at all. Outbid by a German aristocrat. <laughs> okay. Auctions are what they are. I'm never going to be upset with anybody here if they have come into an auction and outbid me. That's life. So I'm not in any way saying here, hey, you're my friends, keep out of my auctions. No way. That's not how the world works. That's not how it plays. So if this gentleman, Neidhart von Whatever the German. It was you. Yes. Okay. Well, no wonder. <laughs> Things are what they are. I'm mad at myself for not noticing that setting. <laughs> Life is what it is. No hard feelings. Auctions are auctions. And I have no special status over and above anybody else here. Anyway, sir, the prints are here, and we are going to open them in a few minutes, and we will see how's the condition, because it really wasn't clear from those photographs. Is there lots of foxing, or are they in good condition? And also, it's really not clear from those photographs, when were these things made? And I'm really, really curious, when were these made? And if you have, uh, if you have more information on these, if you know more about these that I don't know, tap it in here, let us know. If you've seen this set before, if you know when it was published, I had heard Takamizawa had such a set, but I had never seen it. Uh, you didn't bother with all my set. Okay, so thank you then. So, actually, I, after, I was thinking that you were going to also snipe on the Omi set, now that you had realized this was snipable. So I thought, he's going to see what I bid for that one, so he's going to go a bit more. So I actually, I jacked up my max for the next one more than this, and you didn't participate, so we got, I got lucky, so... Anyway, thank you, sir, for doing this. I'm not happy that you, you bid me up, but whatever. Life is what it is. Can't be helped. No hard feelings, sir. <laughs> Let me finish this one, and let's get some show and tell. Let's look at these prints. I'm sorry. My God, I talk too much.
I'm going to have a very, very nice, peaceful day today, you know. You know I do have lots of, lots of deadline work, but I'm going to take it easy today. I'm going to take it easy. After the stream, I'm going to go get a nice, quiet, really slow cup of coffee. If the rain isn't too bad, I might take a walk this afternoon. We'll see. I'm going to have a slow day. It's a long weekend in Japan. So those of you, today's Saturday, next stream will be Monday. Monday is actually a holiday. So those of you who are waiting for Ayano-san to show up, she won't be here on Monday because Moko Hong Kong, the business is closed on Monday because it's a holiday. Show and tell, yeah, like I said, let me put this group away. We're here, we're here, we're here, I get you. What's the holiday? I don't know. It's one of those made-up holidays. I think it's called Umi no Hi, Sea Day or something, or, or Mountain Day. They were, there was a point, I guess about 20 or 25 years ago, where they were trying to uh, jiggle and juggle holidays. And there were some parts of the year that didn't have enough holidays, some parts that had too many. So they, they jiggled and juggled stuff around, and they made up a bunch of new, uh, new holidays. And one was, was Umi no Hi, and I think that's what this one is, although don't quote me because I'm not sure. Okay, let's get these prints out of the way. Where can I put them? Okay, we've teased about this, we've talked about this. These are Takamizawa reproductions from the mid 20th century. There's two sets involved here. And I don't think we'll have time to look at all the prints really nicely. So we'll open this, we'll take one of the sets and have a look at it, and maybe save one of the sets for a little bit later. We'll see. All holidays are made up. Yeah, of course they're made up. But what I mean is, it's not like it's not like a traditional holiday from a billion years ago. It's made up recently. I'm thinking pre-war. You know, I'm thinking pre-war. Let's put one away. This is the Omi Hake. This is the one I really want to see. Let's save it. You know, this is the marshmallow test or, or the, the food test. You, you save the best piece of food for the end. Let's put the Omi Hake away. Will I be able to not touch that till Monday? I don't know. Edo, uh, it says Edo Hake. The series is actually called Edo Kinko Hake. This is handwritten by some dude, I think, who made up his own set. That doesn't appear to be part of the Takamizawa packaging. This looks like something somebody made by themselves. There's foxing on the cover. In our collection, we already have four sets of this in our collection. We have three by Adachi, 1920s, 1960s, and 1970s. We have a Gihachiro Okuyama set, and now we have a Takamizawa set. They're made at slightly smaller size than the original. Let's get this out of here. Pre-war, pre-war. I am thinking pre-war. This paper is almost certainly pre-war. It is pre-war prints. Look at the... This is... Oh, okay. They... they re oh, he put them in the wrong package. This is the Omi Hake. <laughs> so... Oh, I see what I've done. Oh, I see, I see. I misread. Edo, okay, okay, okay. Fate is what it is. Rangaksha is laughing at me like crazy. <laughs> this is the Omi Hake set. <laughs> I outsmarted myself, so... <laughs> hey, do it in public, Dave. Do it in public. Okay, this is incredible. This is incredible. This is incredible. Actually, seeing this quality now, whatever it was I bid there, I should have, I should have bid double. I should have bid double. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. Oh, my God. 
Sir, thank you for backing off on that second set, whoever you are. I've forgotten your name. These are incredible. Tiny regret that they're reduced in size, but the quality of printing here, the quality of the paper, the quality of the printing, no way, no way. They're not perfect. There's little slivers of misregistration. There's a bit of tamari too much paste in the in the seal there but look at the quality of the gradations look at this this one's taken a ding someone's actually hit the thing there yeah that's a dent in the paper same here too someone's hit this thing but look at the quality same thing too, the block has shrunk a little bit, so this wouldn't be the very first ones made from these blocks. I am a very, very, very happy camper. And because our friend here backed off on this auction, this second one came in at I think it was 8,000 yen, something like that. 8,000 yen, it's about like 50 or $60 right now. This is wonderful, wonderful. I am gonna be faced with a decision here. They are on very poor pulpy paper and they are glued down all along the top edge. They will come off, but, but, but the paper, mm, let's look through. Oh, no way, these are so nice. So nice. This is printing as it should be done, you know. There's smooth color where required. There's no speckling or mottling. The printer has taken care. This little tiny bit of missed carving there. They're not perfect prints, you know. What if that's missed carving or misregistration? Look at this. We see the same thing here over here. Tiny one there and tiny one there. Oh, this is shrunk blocks, shrinking blocks. But blocks don't normally shrink this way. Okay, what they may have done, this is just simply thinking out loud here, don't quote me on this, what they may have done, because these are smaller than the big Oban prints, they may have done them two at a time. Let me grab that first one we saw. Imagine this, that's actually now, this is almost a normal sheet of Oban paper. If you think, think with the backboard here, think of the two prints side by side. That would be a very doable size to make as a single print. The printer would feel funny doing these gradations up and down instead of side by side, but that's okay, that's doable. But what that means then is that the wood block would look like this, the grain direction would be the long side, and it would shrink this way as it shrunk. And this is what we are seeing here. We saw that area here is showing a little gap because that C block is either out of misregistration or it has shrunk. So this is my first guess here that these were made two up, carved like this on a horizontal plank, the prints carved this way. Just a guess, as I said, don't quote me. Just a guess, just a guess. We're gonna dig into this and look at more features about these. We'll see what I can see. But seeing misregistration horizontally on a long block, is, it never happens, because blocks shrink across the grain, not with the grain. Oh, come on, these gradations, come on, guys. I have mixed feelings, you know, if I take these upstairs to show the printers next week, it'll be the same story. 
They will love to see it, but they will hang their heads because it's depressing. We will never be able to do this. Not sure the white mark there. Is it a boxing mark? Not sure. There's something in the middle of it. Not sure. It could be, again, just thinking out loud before I get this under the scope, maybe there was a blob of, glue, of Nikawa when they did the sizing. And the sizing in that area, there's too much glue there and the pigment couldn't go in. I don't know. Just, just thinking out loud for what it could be. What is written in the dark blue water at the bottom right? First picture. I'm not sure what you mean. First picture. What is written in the water? This you mean. This is the designer's name, Hiroshige, and this is his seal. They're not written in. This is carved. This is a carved part of the print. In the old days as well, Hiroshige designed, but he did not sit there and sign each print. The designer's names and seals were carved into the wood blocks. So the designer was paid once for the design and then he was out of there. I'm not going to get any work done today at all. Just going to be sitting here staring at these things. Look at the richness of that sky. And the un unprinted area, it's still, the paper is so smooth. Remember we talked about before, I said earlier in the stream, to get the paper smooth ready for printing, it's urabare. You put the paper face down, rub with your baron on the back, or you press it. This hasn't been done. The paper is jet smooth, but there's no baron marks. Simply, the paper was made perfectly, perfectly smoothly. When I show this to the printers upstairs next week, Sugisan, she's going to say, just give me some paper like this, and I can do the same thing. Somebody saying we'll never reach this level. I don't want to say so. You know, I mean, we are trying, but in real, in reality, this paper could never exist. We'd never get wood like this again. Oh, it's on top. It's on top. It's just sitting. It's, it's, it's a piece of garbage sitting on top of the paper. Here it is. <laughs> piece of garbage that's been sitting there for 80 years. <laughs> It was probably a piece of a bug wing or something. I don't know. I didn't inspect it. I just flipped it off there. 80 years it sits there. <laughs> so. The gradations, the gradations, the gradations. This one, there's a hint here. This guy, I think, has done this one twice. You can see. Do you see the little? There's sort of three levels. There's deep, rich blue. There's medium, and there's nothing. So I think it's a gradation first up here, and then a second gradation on top of it. The color breakdown inside here, the gradations. This is just to die for. <sighs> this is a treasure. This is a, a once in X number of years treasure. And to think that the other night I might have given up and let it go. 
I, I'm sorry, sir, you know, the, the, the person who bid against me, I'm sorry you didn't get this, but, uh, you know, it's going to be taken care of really well here. It's going to be photographed. It's going to be exposed to the, on the net for everybody to enjoy. It's not wrong that these prints come here to my home. So, you know, I don't know who you are. Maybe you also would have treasured this and exposed this and enjoyed it. I don't know. So maybe you too would have been a good place for these to go. But uh, in just please understand that these prints have come to a good home and they're going to be talked about and exposed and shared very widely. So, so you know, thank you. But uh, oh, you're here. This is painful to watch. <laughs> I'm, I'm sorry. Don't look. What can I say? So plan your revenge. I don't know. I'm sorry. What can I say? You know. <laughs> this is evening bell. There's two things you can say, actually. One is you can plot your revenge, and second, you can also wait. I'm 70 years old. How old are you? Where are my prints going once I check out and leave? That's really actually still not quite sure. Look at it. Here's the same thing. Look at this. There's no way people that are going to take this much care with the gradation would be that careless with the registration. That block has shrunk. The guy would have done test printing. When he saw this, he'd say, oops, we got to move this guy over. But if you look at the other end, it matches. He would have found if I move it this way, there'll be a gap here. That block has shrunk, and there is no way on this planet that cherry blocks shrink the long way. They shrink the short way. So these were made two up. Absolutely, these were made two up. What we're seeing is the short side of the plank. Absolutely. Absolutely. You can quote me on it now. I said so no before, but you can quote me. These were printed, carved and printed, two at a time. Well, so somebody's saying the paper shrunk and expanded between colors. That's our job. If the if the printer, for example, if he well, let's give this an example. When he, the keyblock comes first, suppose you moisten the paper really a little bit over, the paper expands. You print the key block. No, let's do it the other way around. Let's do, uh, you print the key block with paper that's not so moist, so the paper is fairly small size. Then for your color blocks, gee, I really want nice soft paper, so you moisten the paper a bit more. If it's not good quality paper, the paper at that point will expand. And that's another theory for what could have happened here. The key block could have been printed if the paper is not so good. The key block could have been printed on a lower quality paper. Then for the color blocks, moisten it a bit more. The key block, at the, the, the print at that point would expand and the key lines thus come out a bit farther than they would have been. So it could be paper expansion causing this between key and colors, or it could be block contraction causing this. Color block contracting more than the key block. It could be either one. And also, if we just saw this by itself, it could be careless printer, but the fact that it lines up at the other end, it doesn't stick out at the other end, tells me no. The printer was doing what he could. Although, having said that, if it was a block shrinking problem, and you see this happening, and if you have time, and if your boss is okay with it, you put the work aside, you put the block in a bath, you count 10 minutes, 15 minutes, 20 minutes, a half an hour, that block drinks and expands, and that block would have expanded to fill in. We do this here. I did it with my old blocks for the Poets series. I've seen Numabe do it with blocks for the Yoshida prints. There's no excuse for putting that out into the world if your boss is willing to let you spend the time and money and energy doing it. Oh, these just get better and better and better. My God, this is a glorious, glorious treasure. They just keep getting better and better. I'm trying to fight this. You know, I'm 70 years old. I'm trying not to be acquisitive. 
I don't want stuff. I want to clean up my life. I'm trying, in theory, not to do that. And then this auction comes along and I'm like, I want this. I would have paid double, triple, four times as much for this. Happily. I can't say happily, but I would have paid much more for this. Actually, I'm glad I made a mistake and screwed up and showed this set first because whatever, just this is it. And we talk about socks on this stream and you can just forget about ever wearing socks again. Just whatever. Just throw them away. Nobody needs socks. After this. Look at the richness of this blue. What did this come in at, the, the, the uh, auction for this? Because our, our friend here, because he decided to back off, I think he realized he wasn't going to win and he backed off. That's cool. That really, uh, really did help then. So this auction came in at 8,050 yen. Here, I'll put the link in for you. There's this auction. And the other one, the auction first, the one that I miss, that I miscalculated, the one that I entered my bid way too early. The other prints, and we'll look at these Monday. This is another print set, similar. This is the other auction, the one that I paid, quote, too much, but I am not in any way complaining. I didn't pay too much. It's nothing to do with money. You can look at that auction and say, wow, that's a real good deal. It doesn't matter. If I had paid six figures yen for this, 100,000 yen, about $800, it would still be a worthy item in our collection because of the quality and the rarity. I've known about these sets, but I've never, ever, ever seen one in real life. So don't sit there thinking, wow, what a steal. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. And Vivid KP's got a point here. These are so much more beautiful than copies I see at museums. And we've talked about this before. A lady visited here from the Metropolitan one day. She had seen some of our prints. She wanted to talk about the foxing that they had on some of their prints. She sort of thought I was an expert on this. I wasn't, but I was able to show her a bunch of stuff, a bunch of prints, whatever. We talked about foxing. And I pulled out my set. I didn't have these, but I pulled out my set of the same design, the ones been made by Adachi in the 1920s. And I put them up in the shop here. This was at night. I put them up on display in the shop. I think the conversation had come up. They have an original Hiroshige set there in their museum, I guess. And I have a reproduction set. So she's like, yeah, whatever, reproduction set. I can't remember our exact conversation. Anyway, I pulled the set out. I put them up, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And she and I sat there and looked at them. And I had to turn around to the counter, look behind the counter, and get a box of tissues. I don't remember she started or I started, whatever, but they just whatever, I had to get a box of tissues and just like, they are so beautiful, so well done. Examples of human beings doing things that just, just you can't believe. And the point is, they're way more beautiful than the original ones that she had in her museum. The ones in the museum are tattered remnants and the printers back then didn't care, they just blew them out, nobody cared, but they were original. These are better. These are better. The original version of this picture, someone's asking, this will be Hiroshige's Omi Hake, 1834. Somebody, Wikipedia, original, I know, Hiroshige Omi Hake. I'm going to put 1834. It could be 1832, 34, somewhere around there. I'm sorry. The original would be then. 
almost 200 years ago. What we're looking at now is a reproduction set made, all I know is pre-war. So let's say 19, let's say 1930s, I don't know, until I learn more, look at Takam, Takamizawa's catalogs. This is 1930s. Could be late 20s, could be early 40s, I don't know. So this is 90 years old now. Okay, that's enough. I am now going to sit very quietly and look at these for the rest of the morning, get a cup of coffee. Beautiful. To the auction man out there, thank you very much for your cooperation on this. I don't know, you know, whatever, as I said, I don't know. Top bid wins and uh, away we go. So there we are. And these prints now have a really, really nice home. If you want to write to me uh, on the back here, I'd really like to know, are you a collector or do you have a place where these prints would have made a good home? I'd really like to learn more about you. Thanks for the information if you want to share if you don't so be it okay i am now out of here it's been really a mixed stream today hasn't it this morning the the, the little work that really wasn't very interesting printmaking work ending with this freaking spectacular set of woodblock prints i think what we might do too is we might look at these again let me let me get a chance to look at these more carefully learn more about them and uh, bring them back out and show more points about them if we have to Let's put up the outside camera before we sign off. And I'll see you Monday, I guess. I, again, I don't have any real work scheduled to do, so Monday's stream also might be a, a touch and go little random stream with not too much interesting stuff happening. I don't know. Don't lose any sleep over it next stream. <laughs> thanks very much. If you're enjoying the video, thanks for that too, the YouTube, and I'll see you in a couple of days. Thank you very much.